let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually say right. right. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it is actually in a big piece of the process that, that, that a developer or let's say a As the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Welcome to the Level Up Hour, where we usually talk about containers, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. However, yeah, please do like, subscribe, and share if those are topics that you are interested in. But today, today we actually have a very special episode. I'm very excited about it. I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Mr. Scott McBrien, the legendary Stabby Mick. And we'll introduce our guest in a moment, but Scott, these are exciting times in the world of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which will be our focus today. So first, a look backwards. What is the anniversary that we are celebrating this year? Uh, well, this year marks 20 years of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. 20 so, years. Yeah. Yeah, 20 okay. years. And so I, I reached deep into the, uh, the wardrobe vault to get a, a shirt from, from yesteryear that I think is probably about that vintage. So, you know, a look backwards there at 20 years of what, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux has contributed to the world. But today is actually interesting in another respect. And why is that? Uh, because today should be the general availability announcement of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. We started uploading bits to the customer portal and uh, content distribution networks yesterday. So I see, for example, uh, Luna Jernberg has uh, said that they were installing RHEL 9 already because the content was available in some places yesterday. Um, but we don't do a GA announcement until the content is all the places. So that includes marketplaces and a whole bunch of other places. Um, so for most people, they saw it yesterday, um, but we will go out to the world and say that it's available today. It's getting there. It's getting there. But it, it, is, it is now official. Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 is with us. And uh, we're very excited to talk about that today with, uh, with our guest, uh, Mr. Jim Nauer who is a systems engineer with Case Western Reserve University. Good morning, Jim. Good morning. Good to be here. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to do is, uh, you know, it's just released today, but we can actually draw from a lot of experience working with the beta program because when we release Red, uh, a, a version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it will usually have been through actually a fairly extensive beta period in which it will have been beaten quite thoroughly by, uh, by uh, capable people like Jim out there in the world. And so today we're going to explore some of the capabilities that are in Realm 9, some of the uh, adventures that perhaps uh, were encountered while using the uh, Realm 9 beta. And we're going to also, dare we say it, do a live demo, a live demo on uh, how you can build standard operating environment using system roles within Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. So Scott, did I forget anything? Uh, only what could possibly go wrong with a live demo? And so maybe we should, before we launch into it, uh, talk a little bit about the new release cadence, and then we'll go right in. So Scott, maybe you can elaborate a bit. Uh, sure. And and I think Jim knows this uh, probably all too well since he consumes it. <laughs> he lives it. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, so when we released RHEL 8, uh, we said that we were going to release major releases of RHEL every three years. So RHEL 8 released in May 2019. And here we are May 2022, and there's RHEL 10. So in spring, summer, uh, 2025, we should expect RHEL 10, right? So like no secrets, that's what we're doing every three years. Well, and you know, I think that's a, that's a great value. Jim, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, well, so as, as a customer, I love the shorter release cadence. Um, you know, five, five years was too long. 
you know, to be really, really honest. Um, and in particular, because I'm in academia, I've, I've got a, a kind of um, schizophrenic use case where I am responsible for servers running a billion and a half dollar a year business on one side. And on, on the other side, I've got researchers who want bleeding edge. So we absolutely want the enterprise and enterprise Linux. We, you know, we, we depend on it to run our business, but at the same time, we really do need an up-to-date user land and an update kernel and C library so that the latest and greatest software can, can build against it because that's what our researchers want to run. Um, they, you know, um, they, they do also sometimes, you know, buy a machine and, and then never upgrade it for like 15 years. And, you know, you, you can't take it away from them until you pry it out of their cold dead hands or until the magic black smoke comes out of it. Right. But when they, when they're first building stuff, it's gotta be brand new. And that yep. has been a real challenge in the enterprise Linux world. So, well, you know, it's really interesting to look at the history of that, as, as both of you will recall, is that if, I, if we think about the predecessor to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we had Red Hat Linux, which was on a major release cadence of a year and a half, approximately, and customers said, could you please stop? And partners were like, no, we cannot work with this. And with the advent of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we went to something that was a more enterprise friendly sort of cadence and it was a couple few years and then we had a few releases where it seemed like we went for a really 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 long time yeah exactly it just elongated and i think that we're now about right sized with with this new cadence because i think it it allows for both of those use cases that you're talking about where on the one hand if you want to hang on to that release for a long time there are options to be able to do that but on the other hand, when we think about being able to innovate, move forward, use new functionality and things like that, that we're also providing an, you know, an enterprise ready version of that on that sort of time frame that people need. So I think this is a very exciting change. So, um, Scott, uh, why don't we actually switch things up a little bit today and go straight to the demo? I mean, seriously, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Uh, so the demo that we're going to do today is on RHEL system roles. And the reason I chose this one is because I know that uh, Jim has been working on building his standard operating environment for um, RHEL 9. And I think that's one of the things that we're probably going to touch on during our discussion later. And one of the tools that we started shipping with RHEL 9, I'm sorry, RHEL uh, 7, whew, uh, Continue to RHEL 8 and will even more continue in RHEL 9 is RHEL system roles. So this is uh, some Ansible roles that allow you to apply configuration to your system population. It comes with RHEL. Um, we need to install the um, Ansible core RPM, which is going to give us the uh, Ansible bits we need to run our playbooks. Um, and to that end, let me go over my VM here, and I'm going to title it. And I'm going to do this a little bit the old fashioned way and use um, use the Ansible engine repo, which is not present in RHEL 9. Uh, in RHEL 9, you have to use the Ansible core RPM. And once that's done, I'll be able to install the Ansible RPM as well as the RHEL system roles. Right, so I'm just going to use yum or DNF since they're really the same to install these two packages. And again, for RHEL 9, that would be Ansible core is the name of the package you want and RHEL system roles. And what we're getting from this is um, a whole selection of um, Ansible roles that allow us to execute certain changes across our population. So just like normal Ansible, it can be distributed. For the purposes of our demo today, I'm just going to be doing it locally on this system. But we could set up some host uh, configuration and actually like push it out to more than one box. All right, and then um, I've got an already existing playbook. So um, this existing playbook that I've created for our demo today down here are the inclusion of two of our system roles. 
So one that I've selected is the kernel settings. So this allow me to go over to um, make changes in the prox, prox sys directory as well as slash sys. Uh, it actually uses Tundi behind the scenes to, to uh, make the changes permanent. And then the other one that I've selected is um, the T-log system role. So T-log is the session recording that we ship with RHEL 8 and 9. And it allows me to record people's terminal sessions so that I can play back that session later and see kind of what, what happened during their, um, their shell session. All right, so just to show that things are working, if I take a look at just one of the values that's in the list for these um, kernel settings, Right, so swappiness on the system is currently 30. You can see that my value, my target value, my system role is 20. Uh, and you know what? I'll go ahead and show you the other one too, 30 ratio. Right, so uh, this one says that when my um, dirty pages are 30% of memory, I should like wake up and do things. Uh, and we're going to change that to 40% of memory. Right, and then there's a couple others here as well, like semaphore values and whatnot. All right, so the whole goal here is to create a playbook that you can execute across your environment to set up kind of your standard operating environment. So if I do an Ansible playbook, and give it my playbook name, It'll go through and start uh, executing those changes. And if this playbook wasn't just bound to localhost, but actually had like a, a additional host configuration, it would connect out to those hosts and apply the playbooks on them as well. The suspense is killing me. Right. Oh, yeah. So notice that uh, for this one, for system roles, um, I actually didn't have the system role RPMs installed, or sorry, not system role, uh, session recording. So it took care of installing the software for me in addition to making the changes to the configuration to enable it. All right, so here we are, we're done. Um, and remember, when we looked at this last time, swappiness was just a 30, but in my playbook, I had asked it to be set to 20. Cool. And then the other thing was the dirty ratio had been set to 30%. I had asked for it to be set to 40%. Cool. All right, so now if you want to make a change, like 20% um, swappiness, or sorry, a value of 20 is not uh, small enough swappiness for you. Mm -hmm. You could come in here and change it and rerun your playbook. Um, and Again, if you added in more hosts, it would then apply this change across all the hosts in the host list. Um, and then if any of the hosts had gotten out of whack because somebody had like manually adjusted something on them, running this playbook again would reset them all to your standard operating environment settings. All right, so it was 20. And now it's yeah. done. All right, so you have like one place where you can manage this. Um, and it's not just the... Uh, kernel tunables or um, session recording, like if I SSH localhost. Right, uh, right here. Yep. Session recording was installed and enabled and activated, and now it just happens on all the boxes that I apply this playbook to. Yep. Uh, we can also add in more stuff. So if, if we wanted to, we could do things like add a um, crony time configuration to the box by adding a new system role and then adding a new section or playbook to indicate what parameters we wanted there. So that's a little bit on system roles. There's like a bunch of them. Um, more recent ones, there's one for firewall D, so you can make firewall changes across your population. There's one that was um, tech preview, but is now fully supported for configuring postfix. So you can apply postfix changes throughout your organization. Uh, there's one for VPN configuration. So you can actually do VPN 
connection configuration throughout your population. So there's a bunch, and we're going to continue to increase that, uh, the, the list of things that you can apply across your population using system rules. So, and I just saw there's a, a, an interesting question came up in the chat about using Ansible for config files under uh, slash Etsy. And that's, that's been my favorite thing to automate for several years now, even before I was using Ansible, uh, we were a puppet shop. And I just want to point out um, one of the new features that landed within the last week in both RHEL 8.6 and 9.0. Um, if you notice over the years, Red Hat has been adding or changing configuration files to use and include directive and in a, you know, file name .d directory. So, um, you know, and we've kind of been doing this for years with the cron.d directory and, and some other stuff. The sshd config just landed. sshd config can now be concatenated out of blocks in a .d directory. You've been able to do that for years with sudoers, for example, sseudoers.d instead of trying to massage a single large file, you can drop- Well, and potentially break that large file too. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this, that's a fantastic uh, use case for tools like Puppet and Ansible. Um, and, and it's getting easier all the time with those, you know, with those include directory style configuration files, much easier to, uh, to deal with, where you don't have to try and surgically snip out one line and replace it. Uh, you just you put in building blocks, uh, and it's 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 really made my life a lot easier. In fact, that was that was an open RFE that I had against RHEL eight was could you please add this feature to SSHD config? And it was closed last week. It's done. It's there. We got it now. Cool. Well, so that was a pretty cool demo, um, Scott. Do we want to maybe take a little bit of time to talk about uh, sort of the uh, experience of the of the RHEL 9 beta and how that went and notable points within that? Sure. So I can just provide an overview of how we set up the program, and then I think Jim can, can jump in with some specific experiences. So RHEL 9 was a little bit different in that it was our first release fully done using the new CentOS stream model. So we announced CentOS Stream um, with in, in, when we were doing RHEL 8 stuff, but it was after the release of RHEL 8. So we weren't able to use CentOS Stream um, at the beginning of the RHEL 8 development lifecycle, but we did use that for RHEL 9. And what's really cool is that uh, we spun up kind of the CentOS Stream repos, um, what, in summer last year? So even before the beta program got going, we were standing up CentOS Stream and building CentOS Stream and adding packages to it and, and managing it. And then about in November, uh, we announced the beta and every subscriber, even those with a free developer subscription are eligible to access the beta now. So anyone who has a Red Hat subscription can access the beta um, if they desire. Um, and then we also did what we call a high touch beta program. So some folks like uh, the esteemed Jim Nauer here were nominated by their, um, by internal Red Hatters. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim's a part of a program called Accelerators. Yeah, um, yeah where Accelerators. We, yeah, so we um, selected some people to have a more curated beta experience where we like meet with them periodically through town halls to give updates about what's going on in different aspects of the product. And that's a little bit more, um, more exclusive, I guess. I don't know how to describe it in a, in a nice way. Um, wow. or curated yeah. sounded good, you know, okay. or guided, uh, or maybe uh, there's just more avenues for, for, I guess, exchange. Jim, what are your thoughts in terms of, of sort of working within that, that particular program? Uh, well, so as, as a customer, I, I certainly appreciate having access to that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of capability. It's not, not, uh, not my first radio. I've, you know, I've been in the business for 30 years now. I've done closed betas with other vendors and with Red Hat in the past. Um, but really my, my favorite part about this is the openness of the process since, since the CentOS stream change is basically 
um, you know, you, you mentioned there's, there's, there's have been some, uh, you know, the town hall meetings and what, so there, there have been some kind of webinars focused only on the high touch beta program participants. And that, that hasn't really changed, but in the past, uh, the, the big improvement I see this time around is that everybody in the world has access to the same updates that I've been getting. Um, whereas in the past, you know, with RHEL 8, the, the public beta dropped in, in November, same, same kind of time frame three years ago. And after that, it was total radio silence for six months. And then GA dropped. <laughs> so if you were a customer and you weren't in the high touch beta, you could get a little sneak preview kind of but you got no bug fixes for six months and no security fixes, no nothing. It was just kind of, a, okay, here's a hypothetical peek at maybe what it might be like, but you can't really do anything because none of the bugs are going to get fixed for six months. Whereas now the whole world has been getting every four weeks has been getting a drop of new, you know, uh, new RPM content for RHEL 9. So, you know, whether you're a third party software vendor or, uh, you know, any customer anywhere in the world, um, you've you've had the same access to the software that I have for the last six months, and I I really like that as a change. Yeah. Um, you know, it means it means even internally in my organization, I don't have to worry quite as much about NDA stuff and say, here, this is the same software everybody else in the world has access to. Go ahead and install it on a test VM and and uh, you know fig figure out if it works for your use case. Yeah, well, that's exactly it, is you're going to get so many more use cases trying it by having that, that kind of breadth, right? Because of exactly what you said, there's no NDA, there's no sort of restriction. It's just out there. And so we're going to benefit by having so many more use cases put it through the through the process. And, and I also like the point you made about the fact that, you know, the beta has at, in, in the past been sort of a snapshot and, and there it was and... You know, you bump into things and it's like, well, okay, I'll, I'll let you know that this thing happened, but I can't really test my use case until that bug gets resolved. And so now I think with that evolutionary process that you described, it really takes us back to that, that, that old open source adage about, you know, many eyes make shallow bugs. It's, this approach is just making so many more eyes and it's also being cyclical in the sense that you get to see the fix and maybe see through the use case that might have hit a brick wall otherwise with something that was encountered in the in the beta. So I think it's a I think it's a great change. Um, Scott, any you know additional thoughts on that or so one one thing. So CentOS Stream is still going, but guess what it is a precursor to now? Nine point one. <laughs> already out there. So if you were about it already this week. <laughs> Yeah, so if you're like interested in tracking what's going to be landing in 9.1, uh, like maybe uh, new modular content for applications and runtimes, um, that would be a great place to look to see what's in development, to see what is in contention for landing in 9.1. Cool. So is that something you're going to be looking at, Jim, or are you already looking at it? Um. I am probably not going to jump on 9.1 super fast just because I've, I've already got my hands full of stuff to do with 9.0 and, and 8.6. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of pieces still, still that need to fall into place. So um, I think Scott mentioned earlier, I'm working on it on, on building my uh, standard operating environment via Ansible, of course. Uh, a little, a little longer and more complex, but I love the example you picked, Scott, because that looks. Some of those uh, kernel tuning settings look like you copied and pasted them right out of the uh, Oracle install guide. Um, so I'm very familiar with those settings. Um, but we also do things like you know we 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 have a uh, you know an LDAP and Kerberos authentication setup to go to our enterprise authentication system. We set that all up through you know, through Ansible playbooks. Um, and all, all of our other local customization plus the tuning that we need for ever, for the applications. Um, so, so I'm working on that. Uh, of course, I'm waiting for satellite 6.11 to drop because we are a satellite shop and heavily dependent on satellite and content views to manage our, you know, to keep our versions consistent between uh, test and production environments. Um, we also are, uh, we also use Red Hat, uh, you know, so we use LDAP for authentication. The LDAP server is Red Hat directory server. Um, you know, the 
the uh, the paid product version of 389, uh, which again our, our business is completely dependent on. Um, so and, the, and those are both uh, you know expected to drop later this summer. So those those will be key pieces to getting fully up and running on on Rel nine. I'll, I'll kind of watch nine one in, in the background. Uh, there's there's a couple of things, you know. I, I did open uh, a bunch of support cases during the during the beta. Uh, I was very happy that there were no showstoppers this time. It, for me, at least, it was all just little annoying paper cut kind of things. Um, you know, glitches in Anaconda. I found an infinite loop in in, in Anaconda. If you uh, if you set up set it up to install from an NFS source and you stupidly screw up and point it to an empty directory instead of the one with the actual ISO files in it, Anaconda will fall into an infinite loop instead of saying file not found. <laughs> uh, so <that> <laughs> well, it, just, it, it keeps looking, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a try until NFS gives up, which is yeah. never. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so so a little buglets like that. Yeah. Um, so I've got, you know, a couple have been resolved. One of them, I was having problems downloading packages because of a wonky hypervisor, it turns out. Um, you know, that, that was, that was actually testing on my, uh, on my, my M1 based Mac, uh, the, the, which is not supported by Red Hat, but it does work at least for REL 9. You heard it here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So not, not supported, sort of. but I got it running. So, oh, yeah. Makes, well, makes so there is one familiar. aspect of uh, of the beta that I think mer merits a bit of mention and and you know and clarification and and that is is sort of okay you have your beta right um, and you say well okay I, I you know I put it into you know I implement it I'm giving it a shot putting it through its paces I'm upgrading with you know the updates that get get dropped every four weeks and then production comes and uh, you know, you want to upgrade from the beta to GA. Well, maybe not, right? <laughs> Comments on that? Uh, that is 100% not supported. So um, don't don't ask to do it. We'll tell you no. Um, I think Jim has a, a concrete example of why we say no. Oh, and, um, yeah, there's so yeah, we had we had talked about this before. So my my personal preference is first of all, even for upgrades in general, my preference has always been lift and shift in, instead of upgrade in place. And and the betas are no different. Um, I actually ran into problems during the beta program, uh, just doing yum updates from one version to the next um, with a bare minimal install. It was not it's not an issue. But I had been playing around with the OS build composer packages. And with those installed, I was running into problems where yum update from like beta three to beta four would fail if you had SE Linux turned on and enforcing, which we all should, as Red Hat's been encouraging for many years. Um, I think in my organization, we've got it turned on on maybe six machines. <coughs> <coughs> A little to do work there. Okay. Uh, um, but you know, so I was running the test config with SE Linux enforcing, and, and it was failing upgrades um, because of that. And it, it, the situation is weird. If you had, if you install Beta Four fresh, works perfectly. You know, yum install OS Build Composer works fine. It's just the there was something wonky with the SE Linux settings between going from one beta release to the next beta release where they didn't have everything exactly right. Um, and it, it just didn't work um, unless you do things like disable SE Linux and then you've got to, you know, go back and, uh, you know, turn it back on and restore con and all kinds of other fun junk. Or, uh, you know, just reinstall, which, um, you know, it's, it's cases like that Red Hat doesn't, you know, they, they give us a lot of support on the GA releases. They, they, support all kinds of crazy scenarios that they don't during the beta. Um, I think another one that people griped about during the beta was um, secure boot. So when I, when I grabbed the bits last night, I did install, uh, installed the beta or installed GA twice last night, once, once via a full graphical Anaconda install. And then a second time via kickstart, both cases I did leave secure boot on does work. 
Um, so on, and now the on IVM now the GA is out. I'm expecting to be able to leave Secure Boot alone, and it'll work every time, every kernel update. But during the beta program, you know, Red Hat doesn't promise that, and so you need to be aware. <laughs> So that some, of these, some of these things, uh, it's the beta is great, but it's not 100%. It's not GA. So I, I have a very realistic view of that. Um, so we only have a couple of test machines. They're going to get wiped and rebuilt with GA very soon, probably in the next, next couple of days. Well, and I think that's, you know, I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that people who are participating in the beta program understand that, that it is you know, it is different in kind, and, and therefore you have to kind of expect that it's it's going to be a rebuild for anything that you're using there. But that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It just means you have to go into it with that expectation at the outset, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and if you go in, the beta program is like anything else. You, you get out of it what you put into it. And if you go in knowing that you're going to have to do this work, um, and including tearing down your beta environments and replacing with GA when you're, when you're all done at the end. Um, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, particularly in my case, you know, like I said, the second install I did, we, we do all of our installs in, in our operating environment via Kickstart. Um, so, you know, and, and we'll either Kickstart a, a template, a gold master template for VMware or just straight up Kickstart install on, on the very rare machines anymore that are still bare metal. Um, and then, you know, the automation that Kickstart brings to the table makes it super easy to get exactly the same install every time. Um, you know, we've been using that for most of the time that RHEL has existed. I think I started back in the RHEL three days. So, so Kickstart has existed well beyond RHEL, like that yeah. was in Red Hat Linux. Yeah. And it has evolved, but it remains. It's good to hear that it's still a useful tool after all these years. Because again, we're um, you know we're looking at twenty years of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and uh, it, you know there are things that were good ideas twenty years ago, and they're still good ideas today. So, um, what are some other sorts of improvements or you know adventures that we encountered with the beta? <laughs> have one yeah. uh, so uh, we published beta UBI images for the first time with rel 9 um, and that was interesting but also unique in that uh, like the signing keys that we used for them were the beta ones so you had to do a little bit of work on your container hosts in order to not have it throw up about uh, the content not matching your known signatures um, as a side note the UBI 9 GA versions are all available in the container catalog today. So, uh, so you can go out and find them and, and not have to worry about updating to the Red Hat beta key for, uh, for signatures and whatnot. But that was interesting because we had never done that before. We had always, uh, well, UBI was introduced after Rel8 was released by a couple of months. Um, but now we've gotten really good at building and dropping them pretty much the same day as uh, not only majors, but also uh, dot releases. Well, and I'll just, you know, do a shameless plug here that uh, you actually did a, a really good episode. Actually, we did an episode, uh, I believe, with Scott McCarty uh, on UBI. And I think you've subsequently done some additional episodes. And so if you're interested in UBI and that's not something you're familiar with, well, take a look through some of our episodes and, uh, you know, find that, find that episode. And, I don't know. I'm trying to remember if we covered some of the things that you're 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 discussing in one of your one of your demos. God, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what? What? Well, there have been so many. <laughs> yeah, well, just I'm just saying. Look at them. Find them. You put out a lot of stuff there, Scott. All right. So, um, what are some? Did we have any? mistakes to avoid that we haven't haven't covered? I mean, things that we might want to guide people away from? Mistakes. Um, well, aside from that empty directory for the uh, Kickstart install, I like that, one. That, was, that, was, that was a doozy. I mean, there's, um, there's a certain logic to it. It's like, well, okay, so, you know, I 
not accessing NFS not, now, but it might come back. Yeah, not there's not a whole lot. Um, in fact, yeah, we we yeah we again we we talked about this before uh, uh, last last you know as we were prepping for this show. Um, how do you make something boring exciting? And and the to me the rel nine beta has been boring in the best possible way. No no real surprises and you know, by and large, the stuff that I've needed has worked. Um, there's some, uh, I mean, you know, we can talk about some, some interesting, interesting new features and, and you know, how, how I'm testing them and what, what the future expectation might hold. Um, so interesting feature, RHEL 9, uh, allegedly is the first version that has a year 2038 compatible file system. Um, you know, if you look in the release notes, both XFS and EXT4 have been updated to handle dates, uh, date and timestamps past January 2038, um, which you say is, well, who cares? These are machines we're building in 2022. That's 16 years from now. Terrifying thing that I maybe shouldn't admit in public. I've got one RHEL 4 machine still running in production. That's a 17-year-old <laughs> operating system. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that can well, only yeah, happen I, when things have gone horribly, horribly wrong. And yes, we have an application upgrade that has been horribly, horribly abused and neglected. <laughs> it's well, I mean, we have we have customers who have who have needs for very extended life cycles because very often it might involve that they're, you know, if we think about something like a railway system, for example. They work on timeframes that are very, very different from a lot of other sectors because you're buying trains. You want to use that train for a long time. And, you know, consequently, a lot of IT infrastructure is also very long time horizon. So, yeah, 2038 seems like forever away. But in a way, for, for certain sectors, it's really not that far away at all. Or even it, to look at your particular case where you've got the cutting edge researchers you know, and wanting the bleeding edge, it still seems like you also have some use cases where, you know, 16 so, years is just yeah. not that far off. Yeah, it's, it, it can it can get uh, it can get a little little ugly sometimes as far as those upgrades. And <laughs> and you know, it's weird thinking that ten you know the ten year support life cycle of RHEL is long, but yeah, you mentioned you know certain industries, a single decade doesn't cut the doesn't cut the mustard and you know they they think on multi-decade timelines Absolutely. so software that will last is kind of important um and and the fact that the file system changed you know that, that came up in our beta testing one of you know one of the things i've been doing aside from building our um standard operating environment is we also have a qualification checklist that we go through is you know does this work does this work does this work does this work and one of them is does our backup software work um, so, you know, we use a, a big, uh, you know, enterprise backup solution uh, from a major vendor I've always heard of. Um, don't need to mention who it is, but, and, and the majority of our environments in VMware. So, it, we, you know, we have a lot of virtual machines and we've shifted in recent years to mostly using VM image-based backups. We still have some uh, databases in particular. You want to have an old school agent on the machine so it can mm -hmm. do the right thing with hot backup mode and get the right files and all that jazz. Uh, but by and large, we're using image backup and, and restore. The catch there is to, uh, we, so we tested uh, against the RHEL 9 beta. The image, image backup, of course, works fine. VMware doesn't care what the bits look like on the disk. It's just an image. Back it up, restore it, done. Um, but the file level restore doesn't work because the backup software depends on a proxy VM to grab the restored image, mount it, and let you browse the files and pick the one that you want to restore. And of course, their, their proxy image is not running RHEL 9 GA because mm -hmm. you know it's been, what, uh, 40 minutes <laughs> since, since GA has been available. So, so obviously, you know, you know, short term, we can't do file level restore. We got to do image level restore. But you know, I got half of a checkbox there on the list checked off. Um, yep. So we do have a few. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll check with the vendor. We'll do the updates. We might have to wait yeah, yeah. months for that to land, but you know, you expect that with a new new OS release. Yep. 
So uh, I was noticing that we have uh, uh, a question in the chat uh, asking, is the RHEL 9 UBI 9 using x86-64 V2 microarchitecture level? Um, yeah, I have a clarification on that because I don't know what he means by microarchitecture level. Oh, well, there you go. Um, it, it is UBI the same way that RHEL 8 is UBI. Uh -huh. So um, if you were using RHEL 8 in the way that, that meets your needs, then you, UBI 9 should also be architected and built in the same way. Right. And uh, we, uh, Demon Doctor mentioned having a RHEL 3 server hobbling around for years, the nightmare. Well, I mean, there does come to be the point where, you know, there's enough differences that people might not remember how to actually get it to do what you want, not to mention the absence of any sort of updates, upgrades, anything, you know, that's uh, something to think about, RHEL 3. Um, I also saw that uh, Mike Jones had uh, said that he'd like to see uh, the Anaconda installer handle multiple network connections, at least to be able to ignore the second or third network connection while installing on physical servers. Any, any thoughts or input on that? Uh, so I had asked if Mike had um, opened an RFE in bugzilla.redhat.com to request that. I know that there's some other weird things about Anaconda networking. Uh, one of my favorite irritations is that um, in order to statically configure a network interface, you have to specify its name. But we use predictable naming, which like assigns the name based off of PCI slot and port number. Mm -hmm. yep. and yeah, which, 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 of course, right in, now, in the VM world, isn't predictable anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. And, and even in the hardware world, like... Um, until Depending you know the hardware you have. Yeah. How do you know what it is? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah that, that's... And so that that's one that, like, you end up doing things like turning off predictable naming <clears throat> um, in the installer to, like... Get get the name that you need, and then uh, maybe reestablish it later. Feed it a command line like this long when I'm when I'm doing my kickstart installs that sets it up right, kills all the stuff I don't want, including the you know, netf names, bios dev names. Um, yeah, and it's been a long time since you know I, I because we only have a handful of bare metal machines. It's been a while since, but I, I you know since um, you know Mike Jones brought it up, I'm remembering oh. God, yeah, those, if you've got a machine with like eight NICs in it or eight NIC ports, you, you gotta, it configures the first port and then you got to sit there twiddling your thumbs while you wait for a DHCP timeout on seven of them, which, they're, you know, the, they're not even cabled up. Why is, why is <laughs> that? Why is skipping all these? Um, yeah, it's like it didn't use ETH tool to check if the link is up. Um yeah. yeah, and one of the other uh, gotchas for nine is um, we've obsoleted the network scripts directory and files. So if you look in Etsy oh, really? system scripts, it is empty. Um, instead, that's all managed through Network Manager now. You can make changes to the file configuration, but you have to do it through the new location um, for Network Manager to pick it up. So that, that was a... Uh, for people who are used to like operating at the file level and in their post scripts, they're doing seds to like change things. Yeah. That, you probably don't want to do that anymore. NMC allows your friend. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that's, that's something that's been a long time in coming, but I think finally it, it sounds like we, uh, we cut the cord. So yeah, so I haven't even checked. So does that mean network manager is now in the, in the at base or at core install? Is it for, uh, it was not in seven and I don't, might not be an eight either. It, it is the default for eight. Um, okay. Well, for eight, we shipped something called networking um, that was like just scripts. So you could disable network manager and use networking, but you don't, you don't, you didn't want to do that in eight. Uh, it was basically like people who were really, really fighting the change would do that to themselves. I'm spite. Um, and in nine, like, I'll nope. Take a look. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, you're making me think I need, I need to log into our, uh, our our HPC cluster later today and, and take a peek because we we are transitioning that and you know, our our high performance compute cluster into you know from rel seven to rel eight and I 
I, I am quite positive they had Network Manager not even installed on the RHEL 7 systems. And I'm not sure, sh- now that you bring it up, I'm not sure how they're handling 8. Because they, so- they do like a lot of control, because these are machines that have complex network topologies. Yep. Um, you know, connected to three different networks, different speeds, different, you know, it's good. this interface has to be set up just so that way. And that one's got to be just so the other way. And you've got to pay attention to MTU. And it's a real nightmare. Uh, so to get right. in RHEL 6, Network Manager was not the best. Um, in RHEL 7, it was pretty good. But because of the experience in 6, we, like, didn't make it the default. Um, and in 8, it is the default and works uh, pretty much interchangeably. So like it would work with the IFCFG scripts uh, in eight. So you likely made the change and never even noticed the change. <laughs> it's not until nine that. Um, yeah. You well, wanna, it's the, like, I mean, I, so I've been using network manager. I think I started with seven. You're, you're, you know, I looked at it in six said ah, ran away. Um <laughs> But, but because it was the default and Red Hat was really going that way, I, I learned years ago, fighting your vendor is rarely productive. Um, you can do it for a while and get away with it. But <laughs> So it's like I can see the handwriting on the wall. And, and so pretty much all of my production machines have been using Network Manager for years. There were some glitches in the RHEL 7 days, a couple of behavioral changes that crept in on the dot releases that, that threw me for a loop required going back and changing stuff. Um, it, it's been pretty good in the rally uh, for, for my stuff, the, the high performance compute world. Like I said, um, they have a whole separate provisioning mechanism and build scripts and whatnot that are somewhat built off of Kickstart uh, again. And their, their automation system was violently allergic to network manager, at least in the rel seven days. I don't know if the rel eight version has completely gone in, you know, gone with, got with the program or not. I'll find out. So, um, you know, hearing about uh, the change to network manager in particular and the, and the end of, of you know, the, the network scripts directory that has been around for a very, very long time, Puts me in the mood to do another shameless plug. I don't do too many of them, but I'm going to occasionally do do one. Um, and in this case, I'm going to say that with the release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, coming right on that as well is the Red Hat training and certification. It has updated System Administration 1 and System Administration 2 classes for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 and the Red Hat Certified System Administrator exam. Well, also likewise be available for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9. And so if you're somebody like me who is a little more steeped in the old way of doing things, that might not be a bad time to say, well, okay, let me let me catch up a few things and see how things are being done now. Of course, if you're somebody just joining the, uh, the, the world of Red Hat, in particular the world of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, I... I strongly recommend that that's a really good path towards learning about, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 and, and its capabilities and how to do things. And again, if, you, if you've been with us for a while and you know stuff inside and out, I think Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 is seen as a very evolutionary as opposed to a revolutionary release, but it still has some things like, uh, like what we were just talking about where, you know, the way you did things in the past might not necessarily be the way you're, you'll be doing them going forward. And this would be a great way to, to, to learn more. Scott, any additional thoughts? No, I just, we were talking about uh, when it was being announced and whatnot. I saw just now on Twitter, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux handle announced it. So like, it's official. It is official. We can actually talk about it now. Um, and actually, the uh, the very evil toaster pointed out that just got uh, their uh, RHCSA for Rel Eight. Well, you know what? Here's the good news: is even though we mentioned this thing with uh, you know with Network Manager and some other things that are probably a bit different, 
that realm eight knowledge is going to apply almost entirely to what you do in realm nine. Um, you know, Jim, do you have some thoughts on, on sort of the trend, you know, the, the taking those rel eight skills to rel nine? I mean, would, would I, would my statement be mostly accurate? Yeah. Um, absolutely. The, and, and I just, for what's worth, I just got my, uh, RHCSA eight, uh, a couple months ago. <laughs> so, um, I had had a had it for RHEL seven a bunch of years ago, long enough that it had actually expired. Um, but the the um, yeah the 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 point that the the official training material, the classes, the the workbooks, the labs, the Red Hat produces, do tend to zero in very much on the what's new stuff. Um, you know, what, um, you know, Red Hat does focus on things you need to know to use, you know, firewall D in RHEL 7 was a big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff about network manager that you have to know. Um, there's, you know, I mean, you're not supposed to reveal anything specific about the tests, but there's a lot of <laughs> technologies that are in those courses, mm -hmm. in, yeah. in the prep courses that come up on the test and it's a lot of the newer features in the OS that maybe you don't use in production in, in your environment, but having been through a couple of classes like that, it definitely leaves you, leaves you a better rounded system means to know both the old way and the new way yep. or all three ways in some cases, <laughs> um, because <laughs> yeah, you know, it's been 20 years. Things have changed twice, <laughs> three times. Absolutely. You know, you know uh, so, uh, Pyro was asking, is there any hopes for, for the Elinx utility coming back? And that 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 actually put a smile on my face because because I I remember Elinx. Uh, but uh, Scott, I think uh, I think your answer is probably apt as well, as well as all the other ways that you could actually command line up, you know, uh, an HTTP request. What's your favorite? W get Scott? Is that is that where you, is that your go to? Yeah, that's my go-to now. I mean, so eLinks, usually I would use it to like grab a page and dump it somewhere so I could grab some data out of it or whatnot. Or just like grab a, a file. And WGET does that now. Yeah. Um, and then I was just thinking about like looking at a web page in text in my browser and it was giving me like flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yep. And so uh, we posted in the chat, uh, you know, um, REL 9 is officially available. You can see it there in Twitter. We no longer have to keep it a secret. It's, it's real. Uh, Luna pointed out I use WGET and links a lot, even if I should maybe use CURL. Because that's, that's the thing is actually I think CURL is often considered the, the best practice. But I don't know. I, I think... You know, it's been a while since I've done a lot of this kind of work, but I was always kind of a WGET guy myself. Anyway, totally we forgot. Talk. What's that? I had totally forgotten about curl. Yeah, I was yeah. sitting here. I was, was sitting here trying to think time. of the name, and I was going. I, I knew it started with a C. Cup. No, cups is like printing. No, curl. There you go, curl. But yeah, text-based yeah. web browsing experience in your terminal. Who would not want that? You know, let's you know use Gopher. I mean, <laughs> oh, come on. I still I still install and occasionally use Links, the other one, the L Y N X version. Yeah. Okay. Um, mostly when I'm mad at web developers and want to uh, show them the error of their ways as far as accessibility. Um, because, yeah, yep. you know, like, like, that's the classic trick that we've been using for decades. It, and I'm not in the web development world, but, um, you know, to make sure a page is, is accessible to screen readers, look at it in a text-only web browser. Mm -hmm. um, and if it looks like a complete train wreck, it's going to sound like a complete train wreck. <laughs> 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 right. A reader is not going to handle it all that well. So, yeah, sorry, Pyro. No luck. You know, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to settle for something else here. So, um, but, you know, kinda... so, um and I just I, I just did that. I switched screens and and did did a uh, you know yum list e links to see if it was in the ePel repository on my on my uh, on my machine. But I want to point out this is another big difference between rel eight and rel nine. 
um, in, when REL 8 came out, you know, and, and I know in some environments, EPEL is like radioactive and they can't touch it if you're a, a bank or a three letter agency. Yeah, yeah. But we use it a lot. We depend on it in, in, the, in the university world. And so that six month gap between when REL 8 dropped and when uh, EPEL for REL 8 was available and usable really hurt. Um, today, there's already what, 3,000, 5,000 some odd packages. Uh, in in the power repository on on, on rel nine, uh, that's that's a huge improvement. Yeah, we actually um, invested pretty heavily because one of the things we we heard from customers with rel eight was that they did rely on that EPO, um content, so they couldn't even consider rel eight until a variety of packages were available in EPO. So for um, for nine, uh, actually like. A couple of years ago, we went ahead and uh, hired some developers to work in the community to help maintain and build that and actually get that uh, repository going earlier. Um, there's actually a, an, uh, I'll post it in our uh, meeting chat and our producer can put it out in the chat. Uh, we did a interview with Carl George, who is one of the lead engineers for that project. Um, on another show um, to just talk about like what it is and how it's managed and a variety of other things. So um, yeah, like Red Hat heard, heard the feedback and um, made changes to get that resolved for REL 9. Well, that actually takes us to a couple of things that we can kind of wrap up with here. Um, and that is, is, first of all, we touched upon it, but you know, how does one prepare for the RHEL 9.1 release. What's the best way to get ready for that? Because there are some capabilities that are are sought after and, and interesting in 9.1 that didn't make it into the into to nine. My favorite old sysadmin trick, um, RTFM. <laughs> the re, if you read the fine manual, and specifically, Red right, Hat's right, pretty good about this. Read the read the release notes. And that's going to have the high points of everything you need to know that changed um, on, on those releases. The big one, obviously, is, is Neo 9.0. Mm -hmm. lots, lots of stuff changed. Um, but, you know, look, look at the 9.1. Uh, you know, and the, generally when the, when, the, when, the, when the beta release becomes available for download on, on Red Hat's site, generally they have both the, uh, the software and the beta version of the documentation will be available, too. Yeah. Um, Release notes. And I actually, for the for the dot y releases, you know, dot one, dot two, dot three. I I I do more paying attention to the release notes than I do actually downloading and installing it. Interesting. Um, it just Interesting. you know that that tells me generally what I need to know. Yep. So, uh, sort of a last thing here is, um, you know, we're going to be doing this same exercise again for Rel ten in twenty twenty five. What might we do differently next time around? And, and I would pose this to anybody who's participated in the, the REL9 beta in chat, but I, Jim, you're the one joining us today. Any thoughts on, on what we can do next time around to make the, the REL10 beta uh, even better than what we did this time? Um, there was one conspicuous omission from, from the, all the the, the, the very public and even in the high touch beta for REL 9. And that is the, I blame leap, Scott. the leap upgrade tool um, yeah. was specifically not tested as part of the beta um, because they want to do it just for, you know, the, the 8.6 to 9.0, not for 8.5 to 9 beta mm -hmm. because it's so, I'm, I'm guessing because it's a very metadata intensive piece of software. They didn't want to have to constantly be redoing the metadata. Um, well, uh, if we could, for, for the people who are not familiar with possible. it, could you could you actually give us a quick working definition of of the tool so that people understand? Because I think it it helps enlighten why that was something that might have been a tricky one to include. Well, so so leap uh, L E A P P. Uh, interesting spelling there. Maybe Scott can explain the history behind it. Um, that is Red Hat's in-place upgrade tool now, as of as of uh, when REL 8 shipped. That was the tool for going from REL 7 to 8. Replace the old uh, 
our HUP tool uh, and the, the FedUp tool from Fedora. Um, so, and, and I did test it during the, during the rel eight, uh, beta and, and found all kinds of interesting issues and eventually got it working. So life was good. I don't, you know, like I said earlier in the podcast, I'm, uh, very much into the lift and shift approach. So we don't do a whole lot of in place upgrades, but every now and then you got a really nasty use case where for whatever reason, application issues, um, it's just better to do it in place. Uh, not well, like when we'd spoken it. previously, I think you had a very good way of describing is it, you know, um, it's lift and shift is a pretty good and safe way to go if the application will let you, right? And once in a while, that's not actually the, not right. the case, right? If for whatever reason that doesn't work for you, there's another option. And, and, so, and so, you know, I'd, like I said, I'd, I'd like to see if, if Redcat can find a way to engineer it so that it is practical to beta test in, in, in future betas. That would, that would be, that would be an awesome, that would be my, my RFE for, for RHEL 10. Um, I don't know if they can pull it off in three years, but it, it, it'd be, it'd be, a, I think it'd be a good use case. And there are other customers who use it a lot, apparently. Uh, you know, we've seen this discussion in open forums and in, in webinars, um, you know, big companies with tens of thousands of machines that they just, it's not practical for one reason or another to do lift and shift on that many yeah. systems. They want yeah. to want to in place option. So it, it's good. That it's there, even though I personally don't use it a lot. I have tested it. I'm probably going to end up using it for, for a, f a few, uh, you know, a few of my users on the academic side of the house, but, uh, or, and one particularly evil business app, but not right. there. <laughs> well, but from, nice your, from, from your mouth to Scott's ear, I think it's probably as good as done. Right, Scott? Uh, sure. I, so uh, I actually talked with the Leap team somewhat regularly. Um, so I will, I will suggest that. I think their initial response is going to be like, do people really leap to a dot zero? Um, which, Point. you know, fair. But, but like if we're beta and things like, that's beta of things. So, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Cause there were, you know, and back in the 8.0 days when I, the 8.0 beta, when I was testing leap, there were issues <laughs> and that had not, that were not really related to the specific release, the eight onus of it. It was related to, you know, leap had some limitations that just made it not work in certain, under certain circumstances. I think you know, they had to engineer around those and fix it. Yeah. And, that one was uh, challenging because, like, we we really don't know what people do out there with our stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, Leap was very conservative in what it would look for for potential upgrades. And I know that over the years for RHEL 8, it's become a much more resilient and capable tool thanks to customer feedback um, and, like, consulting and a variety of other things to, to help enhance its logic and capabilities. Well, so I am seeing that we have gone over time, but you know, it is a momentous occasion. I guess we get to do that, don't we? So any closing thoughts, uh, Jim, on uh, you know, the, the RHEL 9 beta and the program and sort of what, what we've got going on here? Um, you know, like I said earlier, boring in the best possible way. It worked really well for me. I'm really glad to see you know, the increased openness from Red Hat giving, you know, all of their customers the same access that I've had to, you know, to the updated software. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing this dance again in three years. <laughs> all so, right. That's, that's really all there is to it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for participating in the program. Uh, Scott, any other closing thoughts from, from the world of RHEL? I would just um, double down on what Jim said, right? Uh, I still hear people be like, "Real nine? It's it's only been three years." It's like, yeah, well, we told you it was going to be three years. We well, promised. You know what? Twenty twenty five. It's coming sooner than you think, and it's going to be real ten. So uh, get get ready. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to remind everybody to like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we were very focused on Red Hat Enterprise Linux this week, and we might return to this subject on occasion, but of course we also 
you know, our main charter is to dig deep into the world of OpenShift. So if you're interested in OpenShift, but also in containers and RHEL, please do join us on the Level Up Hour. And so uh, thank you for joining and uh, go out there and grab some RHEL 9 and, you know, see what it'll do for you. Have a good one.